These days, corporate America seems to want to distill the idea of diversity down to only the color of one's skin or their preferences in places of the household that not everyone wants to go. But there's so much more to each and every one of us, to the individualism that defines the people that we love and care about. That type of diversity is harder to quantify, but it's not stopping a huge push within entertainment to set up the writers, the creators, the actors using spreadsheets, quotas, and other statistical measures that may not actually produce anything good at all. We're about to tell you exactly why. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another video of excellence. It is what we endeavor to do each and every day. We aim for that level, and sometimes we hit it. We hope that you think we do as well. Folks, if you like content like this, consider clicking the like button, share, subscribe, and click it. Stick it to the algorithms. It's the notification bell. We are going to be dropping in on a part of the Pro Show Live that we recorded last Thursday. And folks, if you like this, well, you might consider catching the Pro Show Live. It's every Thursday. 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, we do those live, of course, and we had on a fantastic panel. We're talking about Alan Ng. We're talking about Tom of Midnight's Edge and so many more. We think you're going to find this discussion about diversity in Hollywood to be very meaningful. Folks, enjoy, and let's get to it right now. It's not lost on me that the, the diversity of people does not just come down to what the categories we've set up today, but... You know, I think about the complexity of every single individual out there and just how diverse each person is from the from the next person that you might see. And I think, too, the assumption that if one person falls into the same category as another person that we set up, right, that doesn't mean at all that that person is similar in any way to the other individual because of the diversity of experiences and thought and opinions that each person holds. And I think I think we run a danger if we set up writer's rooms under the assumption that, well, if I get this person and this person and I, I meet my checklist, that therefore I've, I've set up a virtuous writer's room, I think that's failing to account for the vast differences that each person can hold. And I think it pigeonholes people. I think it assumes, oh, you look this way, therefore you must think this way. And I, I think that's offensive. Lorena, what do you it's, think? Uh, you know, it's, re it's really offensive. Um, and to kind of talk about unions, number one, I learned all I needed to know about unions. My father was in one. They didn't do anything for him. Mm. I actually, back in the day, I got a part-time job working at UPS and quit after like three weeks because they were trying to pressure me to join a union. It wasn't about efficiency. It was just how many people could they put on the payroll? We don't want you working too fast because that's going to make everyone else, you know, look bad. So when I see the WGA strike that's going on, of course, you've got very talented writers, you know, out there. So why is it that you want to create this bucket of extra people? Because what it is, is a quota system. That's exactly what it is. So trying to tell you, yes. you have to hire this many people and our cover is, it needs to be done in the name of diversity. That's how That's they're exactly doing right. it. Yeah. It's and a Trojan horse and it's, you know, writer's rooms were, you know, they were diverse before, uh, before this time. So it's like, call that out exactly what it is. You want this quota system to be brought in. And the way that you're trying to enforce that is to make studios and make people feel guilty. You don't want diversity. How can you not want diversity? <laughs> you know, that, and then on top of that, we've guys, got, go ahead. That you can't, you realize guys that you can't win an Oscar for best picture anymore. <laughs> Oh, unless you check yeah. those boxes mm -hmm. they actually wrote that down they are going to enforce it now you tell me is that or is that not racism because if you deny a, a movie best picture based upon the race of the creatives involved then you're denying future employment future opportunity things like that regardless of the story that you're telling what if you're telling the story let, let's play it their way what if you're telling the story of i don't know a homosexual couple and stuff and you need to have straight representation or we know that's not going to happen but i'm just saying you know you're compromising the integrity of your story if you do that but just for the sake of diversity that's what they're demanding for people to do 
Well, and it's you know? and it's 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 a real problem. And I've been saying this, I think we all have for a while now, in that you can't base these things on immutables. You should be basing them on performance, on merit, on ability. You can't mm-hmm. put somebody in a position just to check a box. It's it's just not the way the world works. And it it's it, it's incredibly unfair, as Mark was saying. I mean, the EEOC should be going after every single one of these standards that are trying to be institutionalized. Mm-hmm. And they should be going after these 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 companies, productions, whatever you want to call them, with a vengeance right now, because that's what they are supposed to do. So our government is again not living up to the obligation for these various these various things that they're supposed to be enforcing. That's what the EEOC is for. Where are they? Where are well, they? They're they're definitely not coming to the rescue on this one. Well, they're um, in the same place that the bars are here in Vegas, which, uh, you know, they didn't want diversity in, uh, in bartenders. So then the bartenders now are models, you know. <laughs> right. You know, I was thinking about what I could add to this and, 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 you know, something that would actually be meaningful. And the only thing I can say is that it seems to me that perhaps these quotas, perhaps these uh, dogmatic systems of checkboxes to, to pretend that you have diversity through that kind of means, I think it's the corporatization of empathy, and I'm not sure that that works. I think that empathy and uh, morality and and goodness has to come from the individual. I I don't think that you can enforce uh, morality and empathy at the corporate level. And I think if you do, then you create this sort of robotic system that actually harms rather than helps. And you might think of this in the same way that you think about a parent or a grandparent who, who is attempting to uh, take care of a child, if all they do is check the boxes each day, you're going to come out with a very warped household. There is well, there is a warmth that you need in that writer's room and a kindness that you need in interpersonal relationships that you can't duplicate by saying, we're going to have 15% Asians, we're going to have 12% uh, you know, Eastern Europeans, we're going to have 7% Native Americans, it does, whatever it is that you come up with. That does not replace just having good people who care about one another. Exactly, Pro. You know, there's something I want to bring up and something that I've observed. When I go back to the sitcoms that I liked to watch as a kid, like The Jeffersons, um, you know, Full House, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, The Cosby Show, you see so many interpersonal relationships that are, you know, that are developed on screen, like in, you know, in Roseanne. And that kind of empathy that you're talking about comes from people understanding relationships, writers understanding relationships. And soap operas know this very, very well because they operate on relationships. You have to actually be able to put those in. Now, when I see a lot of sitcoms and other even films that are coming out today, or we'll say in like the past 10 years or so, that has been lost. So you're having relationships written based on a quota and a checklist as opposed to writers saying, okay, well, I don't think this person would say that or they would say that or what about this relationship with this pe- this person? What about this relationship with that person? To create that kind of thing that pulls the viewer in to say, why should I care about watching? I care about what happens to so-and-so. So now we get these cardboard characters that it, some of them, it is just too hard to relate to. And I think because it's directly because of these formulaic writer rooms that they're just putting people in there just to put in there, not because they're good writers. Yeah, let's, well let's look at, uh, you know, a Strange World. You know, they inserted a <laughs> gay relationship in there. Uh, mm-hmm. Guess who didn't show up? Uh, the LGBT community. The, the movie failed and, and the community that they were trying to go for and virtual virtue signal too, they didn't show up. Little Mermaid, uh, they made Ariel black. And guess what? The African-American community didn't come out and support this movie <laughs> like they did Black Panther. For some reason, uh, it just didn't you know what work. It is? Nobody likes to be talked down to. Mm. You know, yes. people like to be challenged. You know, and Raina, you were talking about uh, the old sitcoms. I've said it a million times. All in the Family is probably one of the most important sitcoms oh, yeah. I've ever seen in my life. Oh yeah. And right now oh, yeah. here's here's Archie Bunker, who is uh, portrayed as a bigot, but damned if you don't end up 
feeling for him sometimes in, in seeing his development and his growth. You know, here I am watching it and stuff. That character would have said, oh, Mark, he's a colored guy and all that stuff. Or, you know, we don't want him in the neighborhood. But see, there was something about the way that uh, they challenged us. They challenged America, you know, to mm -hmm. see it from other people's points of view. You know, they used to say you can judge a person or don't judge them until you walk a mile in their shoes. These days, we don't want to do that. We want to walk in our shoes. We want everyone to see our shoes. We want to see us in those shoes. We lost the whole point. We're supposed to be challenging ourselves to relate to people who are not like us, you know, or, you know, for whatever reason. It doesn't have to be race. It could be uh, sexuality, religion, whatever the case may be. This is how people become uh, empathetic towards one another. The, the yeah, that's part, the challenge. Yeah. Uh, Tom, you go first. I was just going to say, I've been, I just want to say, because going back to a point that Lorena and, and you guys were making before was just that, look, the, the color of your skin does not make you a better writer, obviously. Just no more than it makes you better or worse at anything else. That's a given. We all know that. But why all of a sudden is there's a selective racism? I do not know. Because it's, it's, you know, okay for all these, you know, writers groups and everything else to be filled up with diversity quotas. But as soon as somebody gets fired, well, it's because they're racist. It's like, no, it doesn't go both ways, honey. You, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You got the job because you're black. You can't say you lost the job because you're black. It doesn't go both ways here. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and of course I'm talking about a specific writer on super or Superman and Lois. If you know what I'm talking about mm. when she got mm, fired yeah, and she's all going off about, they fired me cause I'm racist. It's like, no, they fired you cause you're a writer on a CW show, which means if you're that bad, you're bad. You, you right. know, to loop this back around to all yeah, of the family. Sorry, anyway, but yeah, uh, All in the Family is a great example of all of this. Well, the so. fact that All in the Family was written with both perspectives in mind. There were moments old. where uh, where uh, Archie's character would, would hand it to Meathead. I mean, he would just make him look like yeah. an absolute idiot. Uh, this guy who is supposedly a stupid bigot would, would still get one over on... Uh, Rob Reiner's character, and we're all still enjoying the fact. Well, that you know what Rob America Reiner learned on that time, Jonas, that now. was that people hated Rob Reiner's character. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Now we hate Rob Reiner. <laughs> yeah. Every time. Well, and, and let's make no mistake, Norman is because he turned around and became Meathead. That's the right. problem. Yes. <laughs> so but let's uh, make no mistake. No Norman Lear is not a conservative by any means. You know, yeah, he's a, yeah. is as liberal as it gets, and he's the one who created that show. Mm -hmm. He's the one who well, you know, there's, there's a difference though in, in the liberalism of his day and the leftism uh, that we're witnessing yes. now. So yep. absolutely. Exactly. And that's a wrap yet again, folks. We are so happy that you elected to join us for this video. If you enjoyed it, think about clicking that like button. And hey, while you're on the uh, way out, you might even want to shout this thing out on the social media platforms of your choice. We love it when you do. Drop a comment down below. Share with us what you think. Tell us how you might. Uh, what would you say? Pursue fixing the issues inside Hollywood, whether that be the ways in which they try to make things diverse, or maybe it's just a heart issue that you could share with us the solutions that Hollywood needs to find so that they are doing the best they can with the people they have and presenting a more beautiful and representable view of the world going forward. Folks, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, keep learning, keep growing and keep having fun.